A rose by any other name would smell as sweet. What's in a name? The name game. What do all of these careworn phrases have in common? They all have to do with the topic of either linguistics, language ac acquisition, or philology. Hi, welcome back to Public Speaking and Oral Communication. Today we're going to be straying from the usual path of talking about speeches, talking about speech anxiety, and instead we're going to be taking a deeper look at speech communication as it relies upon the topic or subject of communication theory. Just to give you a little bit of background or review, if you'll remember we defined communication as the process of creating and sharing meaning, but we also discerned or identified that I that defining what meaning means can often be difficult and typically relies on things that cannot be apprehended with the five senses. We also talked about the fact that the most common form of signs that human beings use, symbols, have their own external rules or are contrived. And we're going to be taking a look at some of those contrived rules or systems today. Now this all might seem pretty heady, so I've deliberately decided to introduce our topic with a clip from The Muppet Show, circa 1982. And now, ladies and gentlemen, one of Lewis Carroll's most beloved poems. Make this a good intro, Chief. This scene needs all the help it can get. Well, at least you're in the scene so you know what it is. Have you seen the scene? Even when you know what it is, you don't know what it is. Uh, 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 ladies and gentlemen, Jabberwocky. <laughs> was thrilling, and the slidey toes did it dire and gimble in the rain. Oh, Mimsy, where the bar goes, and among us, a grave. Beware the Jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jump jump bird, and shun the frumious bender snatch. He took his purple sword in hand. Long time the manxome foe he sought. So rested he by the tum tum tree, and stood a while and thought. Hmm. And as in uffish thought he stood, the Jabberwock, with eyes of flame, came whiffling through the toji wood, and burbled as he came. Burble, 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 burble. One, two, one, two, and through and through, the vorpal blade went snicker-snack. <laughs> Left it dead, and with its head, he went galumphing back. Galumph, 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 galumph. Ah, oh, and hast thou slain the Jabberwock? Come to my arms, yeah. my beamish boy! Oh, frab just day, kalookalay! in his joy. T'was brillig, and the slidey toves did gyre and gimble in the wave. All mimsy were the borough goves, and the moan rats out gray. I tell you, this is the weirdest thing we've ever done on this show. It was an outbreak. Can I just put on my body and go home? Well, you should quit while you're ahead. <laughs> The Jabberwocky, twas brillig and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wabe. All mimsy were the burrow groves and the mumraths outgrabe. Beware the Jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jubjub bird and shun the frumious bandersnatch. He took his vorpal sword in hand, long time the mangsome foe he sought. So rested he by the tum tum tree and stood a while and thought. And as in uffish thought he stood, the jabberwock with eyes of flame came whiffling through the tulgy wood, and burbled as it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through, the vorpal blade went snicker-snack. He left it dead, and with its head he went galumphing back. And hast thou slain the jabberwock? Come to my arms, my beamish boy, O oh, frabjous day, kalu kalay. He chortled in his joy. T'was brilliant. Really and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wave, all mimsy were the borgoves, and the momraths outgrave. Chances are, 
as you read through this poem by the Reverend Charles Ludwig Dodgson, better known as Lewis Carroll, the author of Alice in Wonderland and Alice Through the Looking Glass, you probably recognized one, several, dozens of words that you don't typically use in daily speech and may have never encountered in either speech or written language. And there's a good reason for that. Let me provide an anecdote to explain what I mean. The first time that I read this poem in public, I read it for a poetry competition. One of the judges from a very small town actually thought that I was attempting to use profanity because she didn't understand so many of the words that I used when reciting the poem. She assumed that some of those words had to be objectionable in one stripe or another, which is, of course, isn't true. Not only are none of the words in Jabberwocky objectionable, they're not objective in any sense. What we're seeing here by Dodge Dinner Carroll is the use of portmanteau. That means that you take two different words that have understanding, meaning, and definition, and you squish them together in order to create new meaning. Now, that meaning isn't definitive. It presumes that the reader or audience somehow understands what you're trying to say, even if they don't understand the exact words that you're using. So, take, for example, a word like slivy. It sounds like slimy, and it sounds like life. Slivy doesn't have a definitive meaning, but you get a connotation of what slithy could resemble or signify just by understanding the meaning of those two derivative words. So what's the point? Well, you probably don't know, but Charles uh, Dodgson, the reverend and Oxford Don of mathematics, was actually very interested in the topic of logistics. In fact, if you've ever heard the expression, mind your P's and Q's, that actually derives from several logistical formulas or algorithms that Dodgson devised while he was an Oxford Don. So a lot of his fiction, including Alice in Wonderland and Alice Through the Looking Glass, from whence Jabberwocky derives, was devoted to trying to unravel or reveal the artificiality of language, or just how arbitrary language can be. So why introduce Jabberwocky as a way of understanding language? Because I think within Jabberwocky are some larger truths or observations that we can make about the characteristics of language. So, what might be the first characteristic of language that Jabberwocky introduces? Number one, that grammar is an instinctive human trait. You know, recent studies have discovered that approximately several months before human babies or infants start to use speech, they're starting to develop what we might call grammatical systems or structures within their brain. And we've been able to measure this through an array of scientific instruments. In fact, in a presentation given at the British Science Festival in 2013, a scientist by the name of Monaghan talked about his efforts to answer the question of instinctive grammar. He did this by using computer algorithms to create what he called alien languages, which he then taught to human volunteers using words paired with pictures. Some of these languages were very systemic in the way they sounded. Big things were always described by long words, for example. Another language was completely arbitrary, and the volunteers had a hard time learning either of these. Then, the researchers at the British Science Festival switched up the sounds within the words, creating a language with words that were half arbitrary and half systematic, such as describing big things with short words, but long vowel sounds. The participants learned this language more easily, which Monaghan believes suggests that both features are needed. Language has to be arbitrary, according to Monaghan, because if words denoting similar objects all sounded alike, we would be more likely to confuse those objects. When the researchers scoured through a list of 5,000 of the most common nouns and verbs in English and French and mapped the sounds that make up each one, they found that on the whole, Words have both systemic sounds and arbitrary sounds within each words. So, 
Linguistics expert Simon Kirby of the University of Edinburgh in the United Kingdom also used this and devised a hypothesis based upon it. Just a quote from his study. That's what's special about language as opposed to any other system of communication. You can understand it because it's made up of interchangeable parts. So, what can we then say about grammar being an instinctive human trait? What can we then say about what we might call the Lego characteristic or interchangeable characteristic of language? It's that most of us have that characteristic born to us in an innate way just by dint of being human. There really isn't much difference, for example, between a three-year-old chimpanzee and a three-year-old human being. And I'm not talking about just on the DNA level, I'm talking about fine motor skills, apprehension, etc., with one exception. It seems to be that somehow humans are hardwired to acquire grammar and use grammar and language in order to make meaning. How do we know this? Well, you've already demonstrated that if you were able to create meaning through the portmanteau that you saw in Dodgeton's Jabberwocky. We can also say that a characteristic of language is that it is both words and speech. That means that language is used in both written and oral communication, often with extremely divergent or different meanings. For example, if I were to use the phrase, that's a cool refrigerator, you might not understand what I was saying unless I was using the adjective cool in speech, because then you could analyze that particular word through the various channels of nonverbal communication that I was using to see if I was calling it cool in an idiomatic sense or a denotative sense. The best way to understand this is to return to your required reading for today regarding performative utterances, particularly those that involve J.L. Austin's speech acts. J.L. Austin described the difference between word and speech by talking about both constitutive meanings and performative meanings. Here's just an excerpt from your primary source reading. In these examples, it seems clear that to utter the sentence, and of course the appropriate circumstances, is not to describe my doing of what I should be said and so uttering to be doing, or to state that I am doing it, it is to do it. None of the utterances cited is either true or false. I assert this as obvious and do not argue it. It needs argument no more than that beep is not true or false. It may be that the utterance serves to inform you, but that's quite different. To name the ship is to say in the appropriate circumstances the words, I name, etc. When I say before the registrar, or altar, etc., I do, I'm not reporting on a marriage. I'm indulging in it. So when you name your dog, or rename your dog, if you've gotten a dog from a pound or a kennel, according to Austin, in his how to, write, how to Do Things with Words, you are performing that utterance. In a sense, one of the big distinctions between using words as speech and using words as grammatical or written communication is the capacity to perform or initiate an utterance simply by using it in the speech act. Constitutive speech acts describe so, for example, if you say, have you seen this dog because he's awesome, you're using the adjective awesome to constitutively describe a particular dog. And I must say, this particular dog, otherwise known as Chubbs or Hoth Wampog, is especially awesome if you've ever seen any of his YouTube videos. But Austin takes constitutive acts a step further by describing performative speech acts. I do. You are married. This dog is named Chubbs or Hoth Wampug. These constitute for Austin a performative utterance or speech act. So, whenever we perform an utterance, we are essentially using language to declare something is or is not true. That goes back to the definition of communication, which is the process of creating and sharing meaning. 
a performative utterance encapsulates this better than any other illustration because we're both creating meaning by saying, for example, we're married, and we are sharing it by declaring it with those that are present. It's probably why, for example, most marriages or wedding ceremonies require one or several witnesses. So, language then exhibits both performative and constitutive qualities, which just go back to the topic of language being both words and speech. Language then has been both established and evolving, and this means that language is literally recorded somewhere institutionally, but it also evolves based upon society and cultural mores. Think of a word like uh, gay. Uh, if you were to encounter the word gay in a piece of writing, a poem, or a song nearly a century ago, it would have an extremely different connotation than the word gay used in daily speech today. Or if I were to ask you whether or not the word tyrant had a negative or a positive connotation, you would probably presume negative based upon the way that the word tyrant is used in daily speech. But of course tyrant in a denotative sense originally meant landowner. But of course after centuries of abuses, prejudices, and oppressions by landowners, the word tyrant became synonymous with something negative, something to be inherently or innately opposed. Finally, language development derives from structure rather than function. And this sort of goes back to language being something that is hardwired into the human brain. But it's not necessarily words that are hardwired into the human brain. And you don't have to speak a different language to know that. You know that just because you know there is more than one language. For example, if you go to another country, they probably have a vastly different word for things like mother, salt, rhinoceros. But the fact that all languages have a structure and that structure can be apprehended by individuals from a very, very early age suggests that that structure or organizational function of language is innate in its developmental capacity to the human brain. There's no better illustration of this than Noam Chomsky's sentence, Is the man who is tall happy? This sentence was placed in front of children from an array of cultural, ethnic, and social backgrounds. And Chomsky and other linguistic scientists essentially asks the participants to change this question or interrogative into a declaration or statement. And invariably, those children took the word is from the beginning of the sentence rather than the middle each and every time, or at least to such a high percentile that it demonstrates our previous characteristic about language and its grammatical development because those children took the is from the beginning to make the statement the man who is tall is happy rather than taking it from the middle to say the man who is tall is happy. And that suggests that it's not just arbitrary what is each child took, that there seems to be something within the human brain that grammatically apprehends the structure of language even though we are so unaware of it that we think the is at the beginning and the is at the middle from an intellectual perspective are synonymous or interchangeable. Finally, human re meaning relies upon language acquisition. In other words, in order to make meaning, humans often rely on the symbolic system of language, which is a double-edged sword as we're going to see. It means that we have to follow rules to create meaning, but it also means that we can break those rules whenever the meaning we want to create deviates from social or historical norms. Let's talk about those aspects of language just a little bit more by looking at kinetic typography by Stephen Fry, who is probably one of the best purveyors and studiers of language in public forums to date. As you watch this video, I'd like you to identify one or several key ideas from Fry's essays, paying careful attention to how the typography, 
or how the words are displayed, defines or describes the purpose of language, and then choose an illustration or personal experience that either affirms or contradicts the thrust of the essay. For me, it's a cause of some upset that more Anglophones don't enjoy language. Music is enjoyable, it seems, so are dance and other athletic forms of movement. People seem to be able to find sensual and sensuous pleasure in almost anything but words these days. Words, it seems, belong to other people. Anyone who expresses themselves with originality, delight and verbal freshness is more likely to be mocked, distrusted or disliked than welcomed. The free and happy use of words appears to be considered elitist or pretentious. Sadly, desperately sadly, the only people who seem to bother with language in public today bother with it in quite the wrong way. They write letters to broadcasters and newspapers in which they are rude and haughty about other people's usage and in which they show off their own superior knowledge of how language should be. I hate that, and I particularly hate the fact that so many of these pedants assume that I'm on their side. When asked to join in a let's persuade this supermarket chain to get rid of their five items or less sign, I never join in. Yes, I am aware of the technical distinction between less and fewer, and between uninterested and disinterested, and infer and imply and all, and all the rest of them, but none of these are of importance to me. None of these are of importance, I said there. You'll notice the old pedantic me would have insisted on none of them is of importance. But I'm glad to say I've outgrown that silly approach to language. Oscar Wilde, and there have been few greater and more complete lords of language in the past thousand years, once included with a manuscript he was delivering to his publishers a compliment slip in which he had scribbled the injunction I'll leave you to tidy up the woulds and shoulds, wills and shalls, thats and witches, etc. Which gives us all encouragement to feel less guilty, don't you think? There are all kinds of pedants around, with more time to read and imitate Lynn Truss and John Humphreys than to write poems, love letters, novels and stories, it seems. They whip out their sharpies and take away and add apostrophes from public signs, shake their heads at prepositions which end sentences, and mutter at split infinitives and misspellings. But do they bubble and froth and slobber and cream with joy at language? Do they ever let the tripping of the tips of their tongues against the tops of their teeth transport them to giddy euphoric bliss? Do they ever yoke impossible words together for the sound sex of it? Do they use language to seduce, charm, excite, please, affirm and tickle those they talk to? Do they? I doubt it. They're too farting busy sneering at a greengrocer's less than perfect use of the apostrophe. Well, sod them to Hades. They think they're guardians of language. They're no more guardians of language than the kennel club is the guardian of dog kind. And the worst of this sorry bunch of semi-educated losers are those who seem to glory in being irritated by nouns becoming verbs. How dense and deft a language development do you have to be? Hmm? If you don't like nouns becoming verbs, then for heaven's sake avoid Shakespeare, who made a, a doing word out of a thing word every chance he got. He tabled the motion and chaired the meeting in which nouns were made verbs. I suppose new examples from our time might take some getting used to. He actioned it that day, for instance, might strike some as a, a verbing too far. But we've been sanctioning, envisioning, propositioning and stationing for a long time, so why not actioning? Because it's ugly, whinge the pedants. Well, it's only ugly because it's new and you don't like it. Ugly in the way Picasso, Stravinsky and Elliot were once thought ugly. And before them, Monet, Mahler and Baudelaire. Pedants will also claim, with what I'm sure is eye-popping insincerity and shameless disingenuousness, that their fight is only for clarity. Well, this is all very well, but there's no doubt what, for example, five items or less means. Just as only adult can't tell from the context and from the age and education of the speaker whether disinterested is used in the proper sense of non-partisan or in the improper sense of uninterested. No, no, the claim to be defending language for the sake of clarity almost never ever holds water. Nor does the idea that following grammatical rules in language demonstrates clarity of thought and intelligence of mind. 
Having said this, I admit that if you want to communicate well for the sake of passing an exam or job interview, then it's obvious that wildly original and excessively heterodox language could land you in the soup. I think what offends examiners and employers when confronted with extremely informal, unpunctuated and haywire language is the implication of not caring that underlies it. You slip into a suit for an interview and you dress your language up too. You can wear what you like linguistically or sartorially when you're at home or with friends, but most people accept the need to smarten up under some circumstances. It's only considerate. But that's an issue of fitness, of suitability. It has nothing to do with correctness. There's no right language or wrong language any more than there are right or wrong clothes. Context, convention and circumstance are all. I can't deny that a small part of me still clings to a ghastly Radio 4 newspaper letter writer pedantry, but I, I fight against it in much the same way I try to fight against my glutton. There's no such thing as right language or wrong language any more than there are right or wrong clothes. Take that to heart as I read an excerpt from a New York Times article. College English professor Lynn Rosenthal was threatened with arrest yesterday when she caused a nasty scene at a Starbucks on Columbus Avenue at 86th Street. After ordering her multi-grain bagel, she was peppered with the irksome question, do you want butter or cheese? And that's when she snapped. I just wanted a multi-grain bagel. I refuse to say without butter or cheese. When you go to Burger King, you don't have to list the six things you don't want. Linguistically, it's stupid, and I'm a stickler for correct English. I yelled, I want my multi-grain bagel. The barista said, you're not going to get anything unless you say butter or cheese. But Rosenthal refused to submit and would not leave, so the manager summoned the NYPD, who told her she could either exit the Starbucks or be arrested. It was very humiliating to be thrown out, and all I did was ask for a bagel, says Rosenthal. If you don't use their language, they refuse to serve you. They don't understand what a plain multigrain bagel is. An employee says Rosenthal called a barista a, I have no idea, a word that should also be incorporated into the company's corporate vernacular. In his kinetic typography, Fry uses the word pedant. A pedant is someone who follows rules of correctness or believes in rules of correctness merely for their own sake. Now, we often see language as just like that, as a matter of correctability rather than suitability. But language is as dy dynamic a system as any humans have ever created. And the fact that the meanings and connotations of words change over time demonstrate that almost conclusively. So what then does this particular illustration illustrate? Well, I think it illustrates something uh, that is best espoused by Albert Einstein, of all people, when he said, as far as the laws of mathematics refer to reality, they are not certain, and as far as they are certain, they do not refer to reality. According to Einstein, of all people, math, algorithms, calculation sums can only ever approximate or describe and never equal real life. Language is a similar phenomenon. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we shouldn't think about appropriateness in language. After all, the purpose of all communication is to create and share meaning, to put our thoughts into other people's brains, so to speak. And in order to do that, there has to be some consensus about how one should go about appropriating and making meaning. Just to illustrate what I'm talking about, this is a, a Civil War love letter uh, from a man by the name of Harvey Black, Understand that Harvey Black and many soldiers like him had no more than an 8th grade education when he was composing correspondence like this. Bear that in mind as I read through it. My dear Molly, I recommend a letter today from a very handsome lady to play Cupid. Although not accompanied by her likeness, her image was so indelibly impressed upon my mind that the likeness itself could not recall the features more vividly than they are impressed. After I completed my studies, I traveled in the West and expected to find a home in some Western state. 
but not finding a place to suit me, together with the persuasions of that fair face, induced me to return. I entered, as you know, actively into the pursuit of my profession, with the determination to make at least a fair reputation, and tried to withdraw my thought from everything else. But I found this little fairy constantly and pleasantly intruding into all my plans, whether of pleasure or interest. At this period she met me politely and respectfully, but seemed to grow more distant, coy, and reserved, so that I frequently thought that even the ordinary attentions of common politeness and courtesy were no special source of pleasure to her. Now, I have something to divulge here. I actually do correspondence via Facebook with several of my friends that are stationed overseas, and I have to admit, none of them write with as much refinement or sophistication as Harvey Black, even though most of them have at least completed a secondary education, and many have completed a post-secondary education, such as college or even graduate school. So what's going on here? Is Lynn Rosenthal, that English teacher that was almost arrested at the 86th Street Starbucks in New York, correct in being pedantic? What's happened to our use of language? Do we need more or less grammar? Well, I think in order to understand this, we'll look at my favorite use of language, or one of my favorite uses of language, and that's comic books. In the left-hand column, you see the first appearance of the Penguin in Detective Comics 58. In the right, you see an image of the Penguin exactly 50 years later. Without me telling you, I'm probably, you're probably able to guess what the main differences are, even if you can't read the print because it's so microscopic in that right-hand image. Just look at the sheer volume of words that are used in the first appearance in the Penguin versus an appearance 50 years later. What's going on here? Again, is Rosenthal correct and Fry wrong? Is our use of language and the question of its suitability and appropriateness in such a state that people don't know how to communicate any longer? Well, I think we need to take some historical precedents uh, into our repose. Number one, most comic books, when they are first introduced into mass distribution and circulation, take their cues from the pulp novels of that era. So that's why so many comic books in the Golden Age typically have a strong narrative exposition. Those little yellow bars that you see at the tops, and sometimes the bottoms, and sometimes the tops and the bottoms of each panel. Flash forward 50 years. This is a post-1989 Batman comic book, which means more and more comic book writers and artists are taking their cues from cinema because they think that their comic books are going to be prototypes for the next blockbuster. So comic books are no longer trying to be illustrated pulp novels. Instead, they're trying to be storyboards. In each case, the use of language is appropriate because more work is being done in the latter image through illustration and color rather than the former image. So again, we have the question of suitability, of appropriateness, rather than correctness. Juxtapose that against the literacy rates. As you can see, since 1958, literacy rates worldwide have consistently risen. So if more people know how to read and write, why aren't we using words more? Why aren't more war correspondents uh, from the front lines as refined or sophisticated as Harvey Black. For me, this has to do with the issue of commodity. Commodity is based upon the fact that the more of something there is, the less valuable it tends to be and the less regulated it tends to be. That's why, for example, things like gold and frozen concentrated orange juice have literal uh, stocks and bonds that you can trade upon, as opposed to things that have less value because, frankly, there's so much of it. We don't exchange dirt, for example, because the world is literal, literally covered in dirt. 
We don't exchange oxygen for the same reason. Now, oxygen and dirt are probably more important to sustaining life than orange juice and gold, but it's so prevalent, we tend not to worry about it as much. Language tends to be the same way. The more people who can read and write, the less regulation it tends to have. So, the scarcity of language increases as literacy diminishes its commodity. You know, if I went back in time, even 15 years, and saw myself, first after chastising myself for gaining so much weight, I shouldn't have eaten fried rice for breakfast so many days in graduate school, I would then pull out my tablet or cellular device and show it to my younger self. And I would say, what do you have there? And I'd say, oh, this is my, uh, my old Sony Walkman. It's, it's got a, a mixtape of my uh, 25 to 50 favorite songs. Oh, really? Give me that. I'd break it in half right in front of my younger self. And I'd say, look at this. This is the size of the device that you're going to listen to all of your music on in the future. Really, I would say. How much does that cost? <laughs> they give these away. They make way too many of them. You'll get one just for being a groomsman at a friend's wedding. You'll try to re-gift it to your nephew, and he'll think you're a jerk for doing it. That's awfully small, I'd say. How much music can that possibly fit on one device? Every song that you have ever heard or ever going to hear. In fact, this same device is also your phone, it's also the device that you use for your GPS system and mapping. It's also the device that you use for emailing, texting, and contacting everyone you know. It's a miracle, and nobody cares. That's how amazing the future is. So why is that anecdote true? Because the prevalence of that particular commodity, commodity decreases our reliance on those discrete things. Same thing's true with language. The prevalence of literacy means we have less reliance on language ac acquisition and thus it decreases the formal aspects of language. It's okay or it's perfectly fine to try to regulate and keep the peace in a small frontier set town when you only have about 50 to 100 residents. But if that same frontier town becomes Dodge City overnight, with literally hundreds of individuals coming in and going out of that same place every single day, it immediately becomes a violent, deadly place. And that's the same sort of illustration we might make about language. We have roughly or approximately the same number of regulators, dictionaries, encyclopedias, pedants that we had a uh, hundred or fifty years ago, but we have a greater prevalence of language, a greater commodity of language, and that means that the amounts of, of formal or refined or sophisticated regulations on it have decreased, while the commodity itself has increased. So, the simple volume of writing that we have in today's society, and if you read articles or information about social media, you'll discover that every several years now, the volume of writing that the human species has created doubles simply by dint of software such as Facebook, etc. That diffuses some of the formal aspects of writing. The absence of formality, in other words, reduces specificity. And that makes us take into account just how important language can be by introducing how it can deceive or contradict us. So let's talk about some of those deceptions of language as we conclude our lecture and discussion for today. Number one, language is both logical and illogical in that we use language to make sense of the world around us, but logic and accuracy are not the same trait. Poems like Jabberwocky appear to make sense even though they don't refer to anything real. At the same time, language is both a conscious and unconscious activity. Participants in this system that we're born into called language choose what words they use, but they often never consider whether or not to use words at all to create meaning. Take, for example, the word mom or mother or dad, daddy or father. 
My guess is, is that most of you probably use these words to describe or identify in a constitutive or performative way your parents. But at the same time, my guess is that you all have vastly different relationships with your parents. So, the conscious choice to use the word mom, the unconscious choice to use a word that has very heterodox or divergent meaning depending upon which person uses it and in what context. Alongside that, language is both worthless and valuable. If I were to write the word Y, H, W, H in front of you, depending upon what your ethnicity and background might be, you might consider that word to be incredibly important or absolutely worthless. Because what I'm referring to, Y-H-W-H, is the tetragrammaton. That's a very, very fancy way of saying the four letters. And it refers to the name of God that early Hebrew scribes used to write down God's name. So, for ancient scriveners or scribes of the Old Testament to write the name of God risked writing the name of God or taking it in vain. So, a revolutionary process came along where they just abbreviated God's name. Instead of including the vowels, they just wrote that tetragrammaton, Y-H-W-H, because then they didn't technically risk taking God's name in vain, and they saved surplus labor as they recorded and re-recorded the Old Testament. Sadly, Ancient Hebrew became a dead language eventually, so today we're not absolutely sure whether God's name is truly Yahweh or Yuhu, depending on, again, what your ethnicity and religious background might be. We're pretty sure it's Yahweh, but again, that's just an educated guess. And why? Because of the tab taboos and prescriptions that we place upon language, even though it's basically worthless, but at the same time, inherently valuable because of all the meaning that we derive from it. And finally, that words presume a ready-made idea. That whenever you use a word, you are essentially using an inheritance of meaning that comes with that word. Recently, for example, the popular television series Archer decided to change the name of the organization that its characters belong to, Isis. Why? Well, it used to not mean anything, but now that word ISIS comes with a ready-made idea for anybody who even remotely follows contemporary geopolitics. You may have used, for example, the word Indian giver or gypped in daily speech, not necessarily thinking that you were using a racial epitaph, but, for example, gypped comes from the term gypsy, a reference to the Roma that were eradicated uh, over the century of the over the centuries of both the 19th and the 20th centuries by fascist dictators such as Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini, Indian giver, uh, might refer to the indigenous peoples that did transactions or trades uh, with non-native individuals uh, and in turn contracted things like measles or the plague and uh, because of those transactions. So, because words both need a speaker and a speaker, uh, and a system, a language and an organism, they require a constant use to inherit those particular meanings. And that's a double-edged sword, because it means that the words that we use come with their own connotations and denotations, but it also means that if we choose to stop using words, especially in certain contexts, we're also eliminating certain ideas from our system as well. And that's a comforting thought, because it means that as individuals we can choose to censor our thoughts to become more positive, uh, more honest, and more reliable individuals. With that in mind, this is your Blackboard Journal entry for today's lecture and discussion. Using ideas from our course readings, lecture and discussion, I'd like you to identify a performative speech act that you've experienced in the past year and describe the authority that rendered this act felicitous or successful. For example, you might discuss graduating from high school and the fact that you were able to move your tassel from one side of 
your hat to the other, to signify the performative utterance of, you are now a graduate of this institution. That's just one example, but regardless of the example that you choose, I encourage you to use evocative details to demonstrate your understanding of Austin's theory of performative utterance, and reference your course reading at least once to evidence your thoughts. I've had a great time speaking with you today, as always. Feel free to email me or contact me in any other way if you have questions about either your readings, this lecture, or any other aspect of the course. In the meantime, stay happy and stay warm.